Our scripture reading comes from Ephesians 5, verses 15 to 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is God's word. How do you make the best use of your time? It's actually a pretty important question. What kinds of things are you filling your life with? Uh, you know, as you get older, you get a perspective on just what a precious commodity time is. And it's interesting as people grow in prosperity, uh, one of the lessons is that time is a pretty valuable resource. There's a lot of times we think the most important resource we need is money. And then at some point you realize there's pretty much always something you can do to get more money, but there doesn't seem to be things you can do to get more time. So as people uh, grow in their financial uh, uh, security, they start to realize that with the trade-offs, they might be wiser to spend money to outsource a lot of things they're doing so they can make the best use of their time. None of us wants to just waste our lives, although uh, we're at a uniquely challenging time period where it's just easier to do that. It's easy to just pass the time, staying engaged in something that's keeping boredom away, but that we know is not really valuable and is not giving us life. And so if we're not using our time well, the byproduct of that is exhaustion, is emptiness, rather than doing things that are uh, continuing to energize us, we could fill ourselves with things, uh, activities that drain us. We don't want that. So in this passage, we're encouraged to make the best use of your time, make the most of your time. Uh, but there's a reason here. It says, because the days are evil. And so that's a complicated idea. Part of it is, okay, how do you make the best use of your time? There's the the intrinsic motivation problems of I want to do things that I know are self-destructive and harmful and I know I shouldn't, but I still want to do them and therefore I do them. And then I have these ideals of things that make sense that I know that I should do, but I just don't have enough of a desire to actually do them. And so part of the time wasting time is sort of the days being evil in terms of just uh, evil within our own hearts. Um, but part of the frustration of trying to make the most of use of your life is the world is a world that goes to war and there are diseases and there are accidents and disasters. Um, and so even if you come up with a plan to say proactively, these are good goals and I will do all that I can towards them, it doesn't always work out that way, or we don't always experience it in the rewarding way that it should. And so therefore, what this passage is urging is wisdom. That's the category within the Bible of, of having that mature understanding where it's not just about how things work or what's good, but, but really uh, when you mature, so things synthesize so that you, you live well, you make good choices. We're being urged towards uh, living wisely. And that's why it says, look carefully how you walk. And that's the nature of the Christian life is it's an, an examined life. It's a life where we want to be careful to make good choices, to do good things. Um, Jesus says, uh, wide is the way to destruction. If you want to ruin your life, if you want to um, be ineffective, there are lots of options, lots of things you can do. But Jesus says, but the path to life is narrow and I will lead you on it, but you're going to need to trust me. And if you trust me, I will show you the way and therefore you will gain wisdom. And so uh, we've been going through Ephesians and uh, for the last couple of months, we've been talking about all these kinds of things that we should be putting out of our lives because they're ruinous. Um, but it's not simply enough to know what to get out of your life, but, but what are you filling your life with? And as we go into the passage this morning, there are at least two things that are beneficial for us. Um, uh, how do you walk carefully? How do you live wisely? How do you make the best use of your time? And one way is to be filled with the Spirit. 
And the second is to have reverence for Christ. So that's from the passage. Those are the two things we're going to look at this morning. Um, first, be filled with the Spirit. So in my introductory comments, I was looking at, I was, uh, had verses 15 to 17 in mind, even though I didn't uh, explicitly point to them. But I'm looking now at verse 18, where it says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, on the one hand, there's what you need to remove from your life, but there's also what you need to place in your life. So I, this is not that different than decluttering your apartment. If somebody says, man, my apartment is full of stuff, odds are you're not thinking that person must be really prosperous and has great things. That, that, that language full of stuff makes it sound like they might have too much stuff. Um, and a lot of it could be junk that they just haven't managed, or a lot of it has some perceived value, so you can't part with it yet. Uh, but there it is, too much stuff. Well, uh, figuring out what you need to get rid of. So those pizza boxes that are buried under there, that's not good if you don't want a rodent problem. So just be quick getting rid of that. Uh, but there's some other things there that are kind of, you know, this is potentially good, but I just have too many potentially good things that it, there's clutter in, so you, you want to get it out. So uh, the last few weeks in Ephesians, we've been talking about things where, where Paul is saying, put, put away all of these things, sexual immorality, your anger, um, falsehood. There are all these things that are part of your life that are, they're just, they're there. Um, some of it is really causing problems. So, so put all of that away. But in the same way that um, you, you want to uh, clean out your apartment, the goal is not necessarily to get it you know, real estate worthy, where you, you get rid of every single thing, every uh, piece of furniture so that somebody else could move into it and then clean it up. So on the one hand, you might say, well, this is a less stressful situation. Uh, the overly cluttered apartment is more stressful than the completely empty one, but the completely empty one has no warmth, it's not hospitable. So you sit on your hardwood floor with your two friends and, and something is lacking. So it's not that you want nothing in your apartment, the question is what are you gonna fill it with? And this language of being filled with the Spirit, well, I, I think probably what most of us think of, which is fair, is something like a gas tank, where you say, you know, if you're running on empty, you're gonna run out and so fill the tank. And that's certainly true, and that to, to the degree that it could be helpful as you think of, well, what is it really that's animating you? What is it that you're taking hold of that's giving you life? Are you filling yourself with something that's really gonna fuel you? So be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's just an obvious way of thinking about it. But if you go into some of the details when you think of a car, um, one of the reasons that analogy works for us is because it's also functionally how we live the spiritual life, which is, you know, there's a tank, you know, there's the place for God, there's the place for gas in the car, we want to fill that up, and we want it to do whatever it does to move us forward. But actually, when you're sitting in the car and driving it or uh, being driven somewhere, you don't want the gas anywhere in that environment. And so you want the gas to be doing what it's doing um, to create an environment where you don't have to think about the gas. And what happens functionally, some of us realize, okay, to really be sustained spiritually, I need the Holy Spirit. So I need to find the place for God in my life so it's doing its positive thing. But the ultimate vision for life is a life where God is not necessarily present in any obvious way. And then we are doing religious things, but experiencing emptiness. Uh, and that's why I'm using a different analogy than filling your tank with gas. The apartment analogy, if you said, well, I'm gonna go back to filling the apartment, um, and you put, you know, you go into this renewed, this clean living room, and here's the couch, and there's the table and chairs, and here's something for storage, and it looks great. And then you go into the bedroom, and there's nothing. It's completely empty. Uh, okay, well, you have the option of sleeping on the couch, but, but you've, you've filled the living room, but you haven't filled the apartment. What about the bedroom? Why is there no shower curtain? This shower will get you clean, but I hope somewhere there's a mop because uh, without the shower curtain, it's incomplete. You haven't finished putting things together. And in that sense, being filled with the spirit is, is not only the matter of, of addressing our emptiness problem, but our isolated life problem where, uh, where the whole of our lives are to be filled with the Spirit. We're to, we're to be opening our lives to God. So it's not that we come up with that one place where God is there in an order, and then the rest either remains messy or remains empty, but there's an opening up of our hearts to God. 
uh, welcoming God in so that his gracious spirit goes and, and inhabits all of who we are. And that's when we start to experience more of that fullness because we have the fullness of God everywhere in our lives. Um, and then that's what's sustaining us. Um, the contrast here to be filled with the spirit rather than being drunk with wine. What is it that's animating you? It's a helpful analogy um, because what is the role that alcohol plays in the lives of many? Now, on the one hand, alcohol is a good tasting item and therefore uh, some, tr tr some Christian traditions will want nothing to do with alcohol because of the potential dangers. Uh, Presbyterians usually are okay with a moderate use where you're having wine with dinner and that's okay, but all Christian traditions would, would hold the warning against drunkenness. What's the appeal of drunkenness? Well, on the one hand, uh, as we've been looking at Ephesians, we have all of these desires and there's warnings about our corrupt desires. Um, alcohol can do two things. One is it could actually um, help you act on some of those desires in a way that you might otherwise be inhibited. So, so maybe you go to a, a party and you're hoping to hook up with somebody, um, but you're socially shy. So the desire is strong, the willingness is there, the commitment is there, but you fear rejection. So alcohol could play a helpful role, not that it does anything to help you with that goal, but it helps you with the thing that's hindering it, which is your fear. And so I gave an example of, of, um, of, of one, you know, going to a party to hook up, but, but actually there's lots of examples where I've known people over the years who are very talented performers. And logically you would think the confidence in your ability to show up and to bring your ability there, but every human being is insecure. And so all of that training, all of the positive feedback, all of that sense of readiness, there's still that same kind of insecure fear. What if I go out and fail? So some have found it's always good to have a drink or two to take the edge off. And the drink or two just helps me with that goal. It's not the source of my confidence, but it gives me a, enough of a sense of confidence that I can go and put myself out there. And uh, that could become a crutch because life is stressful and difficult. And therefore, um, that's a path that many wind up regretting of realizing alcohol played some role in my life to help me with these problems that I never addressed. So rather than growing in confidence, I just muted my fear. I never dealt with my fear. And as life gets more complicated, I need more help. And then all of a sudden, one or two drinks becomes three or four. And so it's something we know, any reasonable person should know, uh, having a drinking problem is something to be avoided. And yet so many human beings go down that path one small step at a time. Why? Because we have fear or we have uh, frustration, or we have something that it almost seems like that's helping us. And, and here we're, we're, we're being given an alternative. If you have fear, we'll face it, trust God, go and live boldly. Um, and then eventually your fear will control you less, but don't just try to get rid of it. So one problem, uh, or one of the examples of, of why uh, wine being contrasted here is alcohol could, could help you uh, could, could give you the perception it's helping you with your desires. Here are the things I want to do, but something in me is hindering me, so the alcohol is just going to help me in some way get that. The typical pattern is once that becomes your habit, is at some point you realize, but, but all of these problems in me are still, my insecurity is still there. I haven't dealt with it. And so even though now I should be fully secure, um, the only thing I've learned to do is mute it. So now it, at one point it was when I went to the party, a few drinks helped me to be a little bit more courageous. When I needed to perform, a few drinks helped me to go out there and face it. But now it's not about going out, but it's about being home and dealing with the fact that I still feel insecure and empty. And then all of these things that I was trying to um, attain to help address that are not. And therefore, if you've gotten into the habit of muting those feelings, then it becomes clear that now I'm home <clears throat> and there's no social fear, there's no rejection, but alcohol is still needed. And then so it goes because of these, these desires that Paul is saying, try to put these things away, our inability to put them away means to the degree that they're still there and we've muted them. Uh, then we become enslaved to the thing that has been muting them, but not fixing them, not helping them. Um, the contrast of life in the spirit 
yeah, it feels harder. It requires courage, it requires faith, but, but actually this is gonna to lead to life, whereas um, alcohol is one example, but there's many other things that are not helping you deal with your problems, it's not causing you to grow, it's just helping you not feel the problem so much that you're able to function. And that's part of the, the call that Jesus says, but there's a narrow way that if you, if you follow me, you don't have to go down that path. And even if you're very far down that path, uh, with my help, you can turn around and make a change. And so verse 18 describes uh, the problem with getting drunk with wine is debauchery. <clears throat> this is not a, a, a kind of spirit you wanna give yourself over to. It's kind of interesting that we still use the language for, um, you know, for stronger alcohol, we call them spirits. And so the question is what spirit is at work in you? Uh, is it Jack Daniels or is it the Holy Spirit? And so there are lots of spirits at work uh, that could be at work in you, but they will drag you down. Um, what is the spirit that's gonna bring you life? So going back to my uh, apartment analogy, um, <clears throat> the, uh, next week, my wife and I have this old friend coming to visit. It's not that she's a senior citizen, it's just that we've known her for so long. Um, uh, she, she's coming to visit somebody who lives internationally, so we see her every five or 10 years. So we're quite excited. This is somebody that the two of us went to school with, uh, and she was part of the story of our coming together. Uh, we don't see her often, so we are very excited, but it's gonna require a bit of work. So we have that that room that was very neat when my daughter was in it, and now that she's off at college, it's become the place where well, we don't know to put anything. That beautiful room has become our walk-in closet. So, uh, so now we need to make room. So, okay, yeah, there's work that needs to be done. We need to be clearing out space. Um, <clears throat> the clearing out space is because we're excited about the person we're gonna welcome. And if you think of, if you've had one of those roommates of somebody who's messy, always in a bad mood, uh, late with their, their bills. If you live with a problematic person, it becomes problematic. But on the other hand, if you've ever had a, a guest like, you know, what I'm anticipating with my friend, anytime she's come over, we sit and we talk about what's going on and, and uh, she's just this faithful Christian woman. And I'm always encouraged whenever I talk with her. So, so all of that work to create space is because somebody is coming into our home um, that it's exciting to receive her as a guest in our interaction, I'm anticipating being encouraging. The picture here, um, what are you letting into your life? What spirit is at work in you? Is it a spirit of bitterness? Get rid of that. Is it wine? Get rid of that. Make room, why? Because there's the spirit of holiness. There's the presence of God who could come into your life and fill you and, and there's a sense in which what you're doing is you're making room in your life so that the one who in doing life with will energize you, that when you welcome God into the fullness of your life, you realize life with God um, has with it a certain strength and power and working. Um, and therefore, um, that's what's being encouraged. Now, because our method as a church is we tend to, to go through passages and talk about what's in them. Um, I don't want to belabor the topic of, of alcohol, but we, we don't get to talk about it uh, often enough, that I, I do think these days, um, something that's been on my mind and it's just never come up in any of the passages that we've come through, is the role that the legalization and normalization of marijuana has sort of socially, because uh, on the one hand, as Christians, we would say, yeah, for wine, it could enhance your meal. And it's, there's no problem going and meeting somebody for a beer or for a scotch. The problem is not with the alcohol, it's with the drunkenness. Again, some Christians feel that's too risky, too sloppy, have nothing to do with it. Um, some would see a positive purpose. It's harder to conceive of a positive purpose for marijuana outside of something like medical. And so if it's, if it's, a, if it's a medical use, it's not that, that uh, marijuana is fully uh, put aside. But in terms of social uses, what purpose is there? Well, it seems to be more aligned with the, the wanting to feel good. And sometimes it's the positive of just this makes me feel better than I feel, but sometimes there's, there's a difficulty that this is helping manage. And the, the approach of wisdom from this passage is, uh, it's not that one having marijuana once, or even if you're having it once a month, that that's utterly gonna ruin your life, but you're making space in your life for something that uh, 
clearly has a negative impact in terms of if you're smoking it, not good for your lungs, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, studies on, on impact on the brain, all sorts of negative kinds of things. Um, it's a challenge now for the younger generation that, that where this is normative, well, where's the Bible verse that says, don't smoke marijuana? And uh, there's not an explicit commandment, but there's an, the approach of wisdom that would say, well, what is it that's really you're bringing into your life and for what purpose? And so, for example, the kinds of people that have the experience where, where all of a sudden, you know, that first marijuana experience or the second, you, f you finally feel um, at peace. That actually could be indicating, you might wanna go and talk to your doctor and say, actually, I had this experience where, where uh, I never knew just how, uh, you know, maybe the difficulty in my mind with the stress, whatever the case is, all of a sudden, I had something that gave me a, a momentary experience of peace. Um, is there something that I might need a diagnosis for? There might be a wiser, healthier way to address something that a substance is uh, playing a role in your life, but in a way that you may lose control of and may be harming you. So I think what's normative for Christians would be to say, um, marijuana is likely to have a very negative impact in your life. And why would you want something that could potentially bring you down a path of enslavement and do damage to you when there's a path that appears more difficult, but actually is healthy and life-giving? And so that contrast of not getting drunk with wine, you can sort of uh, spread that out to any other uh, areas where you say, yeah, here's, some, here's some depend, something that I could become dependent on that is giving me immediate relief, but is not actually helping me face my problems and fix it. That should make you suspicious about it. Anyway, uh, the more important question is how to be filled by the Spirit. Um, I'm going to give you three quick things before moving on to the second point. One of the issues with being filled with the Spirit, one of the things that, that uh, why alcohol seems more appealing is you know what to do. Just go to the store, buy it, and drink it. How, in my current situation, can I be filled with the Spirit when it's relational? You can't make God do anything. Um, are you supposed to just sit there and passively wait for it? Well, here are three things. One is, well, you can't control God. You can't make the Spirit come and work. Uh, the Spirit often comes in surprising ways when we haven't asked for it and when we're not expecting it. But the Bible encourages us to ask. So if, you find your, if you're sitting here saying today, I don't even know if I have the Holy Spirit, ask God. If you're saying I have it because I believe in Christianity, but I don't feel a fullness, I feel very spiritually weak, ask. In Luke 11, as Jesus is, is correcting our theology, which is the unnamed assumption that God is not really good, Jesus says, how many of you, if a son, how many earthly fathers, if a son asked for a fish, presumably to eat, would give him a serpent? Why would your son who wants something to give him life, what kind of cruel parent would give them something that would harm them? And so Jesus says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God, the Father, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And, and it's simply that theological corrective that sometimes keeps us from seeing the work of God, that we don't really believe God is good, that God is generous, and that prohibits us from seeing his work and that turnaround to say, if you being evil can do good, why do you assume God is so stingy? So believe in his goodness, and if you want the Holy Spirit, ask for it, and then wait on him and watch. So the first thing is ask. Secondly, welcome the Spirit. Um, part of spiritual life is attention. It's attentiveness. It's, it's awareness. Part of it is not simply believing with our minds that God gives the Spirit, but, but um, seeking to see by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, where then there's a certain way of being in tune with what's happening in the world, that you'll look for what God is doing, and you pray that God would give you the Spirit, and then you watch and you find that God is starting to show you things. And so one of the things you do is you welcome the Spirit and you uh, allow the fullness of your Spirit, uh, the fullness of God's Spirit in your life to sustain you. And here's a third thing you can do, which is to walk in the Spirit. 
Sometimes we use the language of leading in the spirit. What, what Paul is saying is in, in Ephesians is, you have desires you know are not from the spirit. There's something you long to do that your conscience is telling you this is a bad idea. Well, you need to learn not to be listening to every spirit at work in you, but you need to humbly pray and come to know God so that it becomes more intuitive. So when you say, here's a thing that, that I feel like doing, and it's exactly the kind of thing Jesus would have done. So this may be the spirit leading me. And so those are the things I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make choices. This thing looks like something that's an opportunity to bring honor to God, so I'm gonna to choose to do it. This is something that doesn't feel right, so I'm gonna choose not to. Uh, and that's where then as you're growing, you could discern more and more the power and the leading of the spirit and your life grows in wisdom. So what do you need to make the most use of the time? Uh, one is to be filled with the spirit. Uh, the second and the next thing I'm gonna talk about is reverence for Christ. This is also something that's very important in how we experience life. Now, the word to revere in this passage, so I'm, I'm now looking at verse 21, where it talks about submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The word reverence there could be translated various ways, including the, the word fear. Now, I think reverence is the, pro the appropriate translation because when we think of fear, what do we think of? There's, there's at least, if in, as a generality, two kinds of fear in the Bible. There's the negative fear where, where you dread something because, uh, you, it, because it's so terrible. But then there's that positive fear, like in the Proverbs where it says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Well, it's not to think that God is so mean and cruel that in his power he will destroy us, but to believe that God is so good so that in his power he will help us. That kind of fear renews us. So when it says to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, uh, it's bringing in the language of the wisdom tradition. Don't be foolish, but live wisely, walk carefully. And therefore, the fear of the Lord uh, becomes sharpened in the scriptures as Jesus comes. And we're to not fear him as though he's terrible and angry and untrustworthy, but because he's so good and so remarkable that there's something that should excite us to, uh, to be in his presence and the more that we know of him. And so, so some of the marks of having that reverence in verse 20, that giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. So that's the reverence we have that Jesus is so good. And I understand what Jesus has done and how uh, the spirit of Christ in me is so life-giving that that will, will change so that, that in all circumstances and situations, I'm able to discern something of God's presence and help so that I'm not left with only options to despair, but I'm left with options even to give thanks. So when something's going well, you don't think that it had nothing to do with God, but you recognize God's provision in however that worked out. But also when something's not going well, the spirit leads you to see somehow in this, God might be with you. And so, uh, so the hyper spiritual Christian thing is to say, you know, it was so good that I was hit by the bus because prior to this terrible pain that I was in, I never really understood just what Jesus suffered on the cross. Sounds like we're supposed to think that. Well, um, wisdom is to say, oh Lord, I have no idea why this terrible thing of my being hit by the bus happened. And I hate the way I'm feeling and I pray for relief. Um, but in this terrible situation, I now understand at a greater depth just what Jesus must have endured. And so I don't give thanks for the bus that hit me or for the pain that I'm in, but I give thanks for Jesus who uh, endured something that must have been far more terrible. And so that's wisdom. Wisdom is able to deal with the complexity of situations where, where it's not an either or of this is good or this is terrible, but we live in these evil days. And so how do you make the best use of the time? The best use of the time is to be in tune with the spirit of God so you see his gracious working in the best of situations, but even where you believe that it's working even in the most difficult situations. And therefore, um, there's the possibility that in all circumstances, the spirit could open our eyes to see something of the grace and kindness of God, that even when things are very difficult, um, there could still be a light of hope that we can take hold of. And so if you're in a situation and you don't see that, um, ask for it. God, I, here are the, the things that I would like changed, but also help me to know that you're with me in it. 
and then trust that the Father knows how to good, give good things. Um, you know, uh, where Christianity is able to help us so that when we see good things and we have an explanation for it that's not theological, we know that somehow God's kindness is behind it, we still are also able to face the evil days with their difficulties, knowing that somehow God's kindness can be part of that story too, and that could change um, the choices we make in those situations. Um, Jesus himself, when he came to make God known, um, when he came to reveal God so that we would be able to see what God is like, uh, did so in a remarkable way, um, not simply by showing his wisdom and his teaching and his power and his goodness, but by entering into uh, days that are filled with evil and calling us and gathering us to follow him out of that. One passage I thought of this week, Hebrews 5, uh, verse 7, it says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Um, we are called to revere Christ, to, to have an increased sense of just how remarkable he was. Uh, and we're called to do that because because of our precisely in our inability to see the greatness of God, because all we could see are the things we fear or the things we hate or the things that we greedily go after. Jesus comes into the world and it's precisely in our misery and suffering that Jesus comes and experiences with loud cries uh, to the Father. Uh, there he is filled with the Spirit and yet suffering. And yet because of his reverence, he was heard. Uh, and because of his reverence, we will be heard. And that's the picture of the contrast of Jesus who came in with loud cries and yet within that um, was able to entrust himself so much to the Father that where Hebrews says um, uh, he was able to offer himself to the one who could save him from death. Um, what does that look like? Well, it didn't mean he would spare him from dying because the very purpose Jesus came was to face death in order that he might taste it on our behalf. It was, it was in the handing himself over to actually dying, to believe that the Father could do the impossible, which is to send the spirit that he willingly gave up to bring him out of the grave. And so God did not spare him from dying. God spared him from death, the finality, the capture of it. And so what we're told is because of the reverence of Christ, he was able to die that death that would be coming for us all, but so that we who do not have that reverence and fear, we who have made a mess of things, can find that in him, the goodness of the Father will extend to us as well, that we will not um, miss death entirely, but we won't get pulled into it eternally. But as Jesus faced death, and because of his reverence, the Father brought him out of it, so if we are in Christ, we can face death. And because of the reverence, because of the goodness of Christ, we will be brought out of it. Um, and that's where there's a connection with the working of the Spirit. Jesus, who was filled with the Spirit, it's the Spirit that brought him back to life. And Ephesians says, it's we who are dead in our sins, who have been brought to life by the working of the Spirit. And so now, because of what he has done on our behalf, it radically changes things. And it's the work of the Spirit that opens our eyes to see the reality of God in Jesus Christ. Because you could read the Gospels and get nothing from them. You can pray that God, uh, or you could, you could think theologically about things, but get nothing. But when the Spirit shows you the reality of Christ, his goodness, when you start to get a sense that Jesus really was wise, Jesus was really loving, Jesus was really compassionate, Jesus really promised us something of value. When those things start to to become desirable, start to become real. It's because of the working of the Spirit. It's as the Spirit is filling us and renewing us that we're able to see that Jesus is to be revered. And so how do you know if you're growing in grace? Are you growing in reverence for Christ? And that's the thing, uh, we're always looking for how do I know if the, if the Spirit's working and what we're looking for is a feeling. Well, if the Spirit's working, it would be strange if you didn't feel renewal. Um, but the days are evil, 
some of us biologically, our, our feelings, uh, we're suffering. How do you know the Spirit's at work? Are you seeing the grace of Christ? If there's something there that you say, yeah, that is true, that is real, that's desirable, well, that's the evidence that the Spirit is working. So pray for a greater fullness, pray for a greater sense of that grace of Christ. And so uh, here are two markers that you have reverence for Christ. One is God puts a song in our hearts. Um, when the Spirit is working in us, it says that we should be addressing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. When the Spirit works to renew our hearts so that we see something of the truth, something of the grace, it should, it should bring a song out in us. Uh, and a song is a thing of beauty. A uh, song is a thing of connection and, and strength as people get together to sing. Uh, that's part of the church. Maybe church is not the most exciting gathering in New York, but to assemble people that have a spirit-filled song put in their hearts, to come together and to say, we are going to remember the grace of God together, that actually, the more you have of that, the more you will have of true joy. And even if you're just showing up by discipline, but you're genuinely seeking that, that's what's going to produce good life in you. Uh, and going back to this analogy about being filled with the spirit rather than being drunk with wine, when you think of so much of social life in New York, where are the places that alcohol is present? Well, the place where we are insecure, that we fear rejection, or the place that we have some greedy desire that we want to make sure that everybody else's judgment is muted. And so alcohol makes it seem like it creates the most fun situations. And sometimes those are the places of, of maybe strongest laughter. Uh, but the next day, the hangover, the headache, or the person who is angry with what happened, or a community that can't really be held together if your only habits are coming together to drink, what spirit would, would um, indicate a greater depth? And I was thinking this week about, um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen or heard of drunk Shakespeare. So, uh, so apparently that's a phenomenon where, where each night in the play, one actor uh, gets completely drunk, and then they have to get through the play with that person there. I haven't seen it, but I can understand why that would be funny. You know, Shakespeare is kind of the standard for actors, uh, and then to be like, now you've got to get through Shakespeare, but inebriated, uh, and everybody else has, has to get through the play with that difficult person. It sounds like a lot of fun. And it's caught on to these spinoffs of drunk history, but, but, you know, why is that not spinning off to everything? Why is there no drunk New York Philharmonic? So, you know, if this is such a great idea, well, you know, there's a certain sense if you said, okay, the chair of every section is going to show up drunk, and then we're doing Beethoven's Ninth, you would get 15 great seconds at the beginning, but try listening to the rest of that piece, it would be like, okay, the joke's over, and this is, now this is painful. Uh, and maybe there's a laugh every now and then, but, but could we just do, you know, uh, an aria or something? I can't sit through, like, a whole hour of these drunk musicians trying to make music. There's something there that's not gonna work. I pr I'd like to see drunk New York City Ballet. I don't think that uh, legally that's a nightmare, so I don't know that anybody would ensure that, but that's just because I you know, grew up uh, watching the Three Stooges. Uh, but most situations you would say, you know what, the drunk version of this is not gonna make it better. It's gonna take all of the skill, all of the ability, everything that makes this beautiful, and it's gonna make it impossible. And there's something about us thinking that, you know, the greatest place that I could go and have joy would be to get together where I could forget my problems. Um, and there's something about church life where it's meant to be joyful, but we're supposed to get together and to be honest, like, okay, you know, here we are, let's give thanks for every good things, but we're facing the reality that there are problems still there. And so we're a community that will name them, that will deal with them. But over time, there's a kind of joy that sustains us that, that uh, we can be a community that laughs together, but we could also be a community that cries together, and we could be an imperfect community that's really growing. Um, for that to happen, we need a, to be a spirit-filled community. And so if we're seeking to be filled with the spirit, we could be a community that really has deep and growing joy. And here's the last thing that I'll say uh, is just how it relates to one another. Um, why is reverence for Christ, how we relate to one another, one another, why is reverence for Christ important? Well, verse 21 says that we should be submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that's quite important. It, it doesn't say submit to people because you fear them, submit to them because they have titles, submit to them because they demand it. Your submission to them actually has less to do with them. 
but it has to do with an attitude you have towards Christ. And this is the way of true freedom. And the reason I'm highlighting that now is because the next three sections in Ephesians give examples of, why, of, of how submission works out in daily life. And uh, that's a really hard concept. And it's a distinctly hard concept if we're making people submit to one another. Um, here, the, the picture is different because Jesus is so good because he submitted himself to death because he revered God and suffered all things. You can trust him fully. So out of reverence for him, that will change how you relate to everyone. And, and it creates the possibility of genuine freedom where somebody that you do fear that tries to pull rank on you, at the end of the day, you know that that person is accountable to God. And so as you make your choices to how you respond to that situation, you make your choices not in relation to them and what they demand, but in relations to Christ and what's good and where that works itself out in this picture of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, it's a picture of real humility. It's a picture of real love, which, which allows imperfect people, um, because it's easy to submit to one another when everyone is nice and kind and generous and things are going well. Then this principle is easy to enact. All it takes is one person to do something wrong, and then it starts to feel unfair. It starts to feel dangerous. The picture here is that you should submit to no person because they demand it of you, but, but Jesus Christ uh, invites you to follow him. And if, as you revere him, it enables you uh, to relate humbly in the same way that Jesus did. And it allows for a community of imperfect people because in the church we will fail. And if I'm submitting to you and you're submitting to me, and that's how it works, when something goes wrong, we need to call this off and then everything crumbles. The possibility is if I'm submitting to Christ and you're submitting to Christ out of reverence, then we could submit to one another. Now one of us is not walking in the spirit, but is walking in the flesh. Uh, the person who is now not uh, being shaped by the person who is doing the wrong thing, but is remaining being shaped by the one who did the right thing, Jesus, is the stability in that relationship. And therefore, for us as a church, we need to be prepared for things to go wrong. Christians fail. But to the degree that each of us by the Spirit has reverence for Christ, uh, the whole thing doesn't need to fall apart. But we could remain filled with the Spirit, uh, and, and therefore we can humbly love one another. We're going to talk about that more in the upcoming weeks, so that's all I'll say for now. But uh, I just want to say that those two things, if you're looking to make the, the best use of your time, be filled with the Spirit and have reverence for Christ and you will see the power of God's gracious work in producing good things in your life. Let me pray for us. Our Father, um, we need this gracious working of your spirit, and so we ask for it. We ask for your spirit to work in power uh, in our lives, in the fullness of our lives, to renew our hearts and minds, to align everything according to your will and your ways, and to cleanse us from everything that's holding us back. Um, Lord, do that gracious working in our midst, and we pray that it would bear fruit, that we would be a worshiping community, a, a, a revering community, a Christ-honoring community, and a community that walks by that spirit that you've so graciously uh, entrusted to us. And so, Lord, we give thanks to you and pray that uh, as we continue to worship this morning, we would worship from the heart, remembering that Jesus has been so kind and gracious by, by the spirit with us this morning. Show us more of that, even as we continue to meet together, we pray in his name. Amen.